All right, my friends, we've got a whole bunch of experience with Docker under our belts, so now it's time to move on to the world of Kubernetes. In this section, we're going to start doing a little introduction to the world of Kubernetes, first beginning by answering two very important questions. First off, what is Kubernetes? Secondly, why would we ever want to use it? Now we're going to try to answer both these questions at the same time inside this section, so let's get to it. All right, so to begin, I want you to think back to the Elastic Beanstalk application that we just put together. Inside that application, we had four different containers running at the same exact time. We had Nginx, which was forwarding traffic to our server and our client. And then behind the scenes, we kind of had that worker process running as well. And of course, we had a copy of Redis and Postgres running as well, but those didn't, weren't really containers that were running with the rest of all of our other containers as well. They were outside services. Now, I want to think about this application, and I want to ask you a very simple question. How would we scale up this application? In other words, if we started getting a lot of traffic and we started having a lot of different users starting to enter in different numbers to calculate the Fibonacci sequence for, how would we kind of respond to that? Well, if I had to take a guess, I would say that it would probably be this worker container over here that was doing the absolute brunt of all the work inside of our application. In other words, this worker process was using an algorithm for calculating that Fibonacci value that was very inefficient. And we very purposefully left it kind of inefficient just to see what would happen if it took a long time for that particular container to get some work done. And so if we started having a lot of users making use of our application, the most critical part to make sure that this thing was working correctly or the entire application was working correctly would have been this worker container over here. Now, ideally, what would have been really nice is if we had some way to easily spin up multiple processes or multiple containers of that worker image. And so if we had like three users come into our application at the exact same time, it would have been great if we had three different workers, one of each could have been used to create or to calculate a different Fibonacci value. However, this would have been rather challenging to do in the world of Elastic Beanstalk. You see, in order to scale a application by default with Elastic Beanstalk, here's what actually happens behind the scenes. So this is the typical scaling strategy for Elastic Beanstalk. Rather than creating more copies of a single container, Elastic Beanstalk looks at that docker run.aws.json file, and it spins up additional copies of the entire set of containers. In other words, we can kind of imagine that to scale up our application, Elastic Beanstalk would have created maybe two, three, four, five different sets of all of our containers. Now, unfortunately, we don't really have a lot of control over what each of these different groups of containers are doing. In other words, on each of these different groups of containers, we got an additional copy of Nginx, an additional copy of the server, and an additional copy of the client. But at the end of the day, chances are, that the Nginx or the client or the server images or containers that we were running were not going to be really the limiting factor of performance inside of our application. Like we just discussed, it was the worker container that was the limiting factor. And so it would have been way more ideal to scale our application if we had the opportunity to do something a little bit more like this. Let me show you. It would have been just great if we had the ability to spin up these additional machines and just create a ton of additional copies of that worker container on each one. Chances are we didn't really need multiple copies of Nginx or the server API or the client. They were all relatively simple and for the most part, we're just kind of serving up flat files or responding to very simple API requests. It was only the worker container that was doing some major computational work inside of our application. And so it probably would have been ideal if we could have done something like this instead. So as you might imagine, this is the type of approach that Kubernetes would allow us to have. If we were making use of Kubernetes, we could have had additional machines running each of our containers, and we could have had a lot of control over what these additional machines were doing or what containers they were running. So let's take a look at a quick diagram of how Kubernetes could have been used to solve this entire scaling issue. So what you see on the screen right here is a diagram of a very simple Kubernetes cluster. A cluster in the world of Kubernetes is the assembly of something called a master and one or more nodes. 
A node, which is each of these blue boxes right here, are a virtual machine or a physical computer that is going to be used to run some number of different containers. So each of these different virtual machines or physical computers that you see right here can be used to run different sets of containers. Now, I want to be really clear that each of them can run different containers, like different images, or even different numbers. So for example, the node on the far right hand side over here is running three separate containers, and the one in the middle is running just one container. These can be completely different containers. They don't have to be identical. And so in the world of Kubernetes, you can imagine that we could have very easily gotten closer to a kind of scaling flow like this right here. Or maybe we had just one node or one virtual machine that was running Nginx, our server and our client. And then maybe we had a bunch of additional nodes or virtual machines that were running copies of our worker image. Now in the world of Kubernetes, all these different nodes that get created are managed by something called a master. This master down here has a set of different programs running on it that control what each of these different nodes is running at any given time. You and I as developers interact with a Kubernetes cluster by reaching out to this master right here. You and I give some set of directions to the master. For example, we might say, hey, please run five containers using the client worker image. The master receives that command and then ultimately relays that command to all of these different nodes. Now outside of our cluster, which is represented by this gray block box right here, we have a load balancer, which will take some amount of outside traffic in the form of network requests and relay all those requests into each of our different nodes. Now, one thing that's going to be a big point of discussion for us is exactly how this node balancer works. And so that's going to be something that we talk about inside of the next many videos on Kubernetes that we're going to go through as well. Okay, so in this section, just a very high level discussion on Kubernetes and what it is and what it does for us. So at this point, I think we've kind of established that Kubernetes is a system for running many different containers. So different types of containers, different numbers of containers over several different computers or virtual machines. And we would choose to use Kubernetes if we had the need to scale up our application and run multiple different types of containers in different quantities. If we only wanted to have a system where we essentially ran Let's go back way over here. If we ran the same set of containers over and over again, like you see right here, not a lot of good reason to use Kubernetes. Again, we want to use it anytime we expect to have an application that consists of many different types of containers running in different quantities on multiple different computers. All right, so with all that in mind, let's take a quick pause right here and continue in the next section. In the last section, we said that Kubernetes is a system for running many different types of containers over multiple machines, and we choose to use it if we have an application that specifically requires us to run multiple different types of containers. If you are planning on creating an application that would largely just have one type of container inside of it, Kubernetes might not be the best solution for you. Now, in this section, we're going to continue a little bit more by talking about how we use Kubernetes in a development or production environment, and then we're going to start setting up Kubernetes on our local machine. All right. So when we work with Kubernetes, there is a very large distinction between using it in a development environment, as in on your local computer, and in a production environment, where you would expect some outside traffic or users to visit your application. In a development environment, we make use of Kubernetes by using a program called Minikube. Minikube is a command line tool whose sole purpose is going to be to set up a tiny little Kubernetes cluster, like the one you see right here, on your local computer. We'll talk about what Minikube does in just a little bit, but for right now, just understand that it's a program that is used to set up Kubernetes on your local machine. When we start using Kubernetes in a production capacity, we very frequently make use of what are called managed solutions. Managed solutions are references to outside cloud providers such as Google Cloud or Amazon AWS that will set up an entire Kubernetes cluster for you and take care of a lot of very low level tasks that are required to get everything working the way you expect in a secure fashion. 
And so if you're making use of Kubernetes on AWS, you would be making use of something called Amazon's Elastic Container Service with Kubernetes, which is abbreviated as EKS. And if you make use of it on Google Cloud, you would be making use of something called Kubernetes Engine, or GKE for short. You always also have the option to set up a Kubernetes cluster on your own as a sort of do-it-yourself option. And so you do not have to use these managed solutions that set up everything for you. But when you're first getting started with Kubernetes, it's without a doubt far easier to go with one of these managed solutions until you actually really have a deep understanding of Kubernetes and how it all works together. All right, so the big takeaway in this section is that in a development environment, you and I are going to be making use of something called Minikube. In a production environment, we very frequently make use of these managed solutions. Now we're going to start installing Kubernetes on our local machine in the next section, but before we do, I want to tell you just a little bit more about the setup process. So again, when you're developing locally, you're going to be making use of a program called Minikube. Minikube is going to create a Kubernetes cluster on your local machine. And so behind the scenes, it's essentially going to create a virtual machine whose sole purpose is going to be to run some number of containers. Minikube is a program that is used to create this virtual machine or this single node on your computer. In order to interact with this thing, you and I are going to be using a program called kubectl. kubectl is the program that is used to interact with a Kubernetes cluster in general and manage what all the different nodes are doing and what different containers they are running. So the reason I'm showing you this diagram right here is that we're going to start using a lot of different programs to work with Kubernetes, and it's going to very quickly become a little bit confusing as to what program is doing what. And so as everything moves forward from this point on, I want you to remember that we use kubectl anytime that we want to tell a virtual machine or a node what set of containers it's supposed to be running, or essentially manage what the node is doing. And we use the program Minikube just to create and run a Kubernetes cluster on your local machine. When you start moving to a production environment, this Minikube thing down here falls away. So we only make use of Minikube in a local environment. However, kubectl is going to be a program that you use both locally and production. So even when you start to deploy your application on a Kubernetes cluster off to say Google Cloud, we will continue to use kubectl. All right, so here's what we're going to do to set up Kubernetes on our local machine. We're gonna first install that kubectl program. We then have to install a virtual machine driver that's going to allow us to create that virtual machine that we mentioned just a second ago on your local computer. Now, I want you to remember back to our entire discussion about Docker a long time ago. You'll recall that we had said that when we installed Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows, it was technically creating a virtual machine at the same time. So that's essentially the same thing that's happening in the world of Kubernetes. The only difference is that Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows installed that virtual machine for you and all the associated software with it. In the world of Kubernetes, not quite so automatic. You and I have to install a little bit of software that's going to allow Kubernetes to create, or Minikube in this case, to create a virtual machine for you. Now to install this virtual machine, we're going to be installing a program in particular called VirtualBox. So after we install kubectl and VirtualBox, we're then going to install Minikube. Again, this is the piece of software that it allows you to create a Kubernetes installation on your local computer. All right, so that's it. Let's take a quick pause right here. When we come back to the next section, we're going to start going through this setup process on Mac OS and Windows. So quick break, and I'll see you in just a minute. In this section, we're going to walk through the setup of Kubernetes on your local machine for the Mac OS operating system. So if you are running Windows, pause the video right now and continue to the next section. All right, so for Mac, here are the series of steps that we're going to go through. And I added one or two inside of here. Uh, beyond what we saw just a moment ago. Don't worry, it's not a lot of extra work. So to install the majority of all this stuff, we're going to be using a package manager called Homebrew. Chances are that you might already have Homebrew installed, but we're going to first just double check to make sure that you do have it installed. And if you don't, we'll very quickly add it to your machine. So to make sure that Homebrew is installed on your local machine, we'll open up our terminal, and then we'll run which brew. Now, if you see something like this right here, if you see a path to homebrew, you're good, and you do not need to do the extra step. 
If you see a message that says like brew command unrecognized or command not found, then you do have to go through this extra download brew step right here. Okay, so if you saw an error message, we're going to go to brew.sh in a new browser tab and download and install Homebrew. It's very quick. So inside of a new browser tab, I'll navigate to brew.sh. I'll find the script right here on the very center. I'll copy the entire thing. I'll flip back over to my terminal and I'll run it. Now I already have Homebrew installed, so I'm not going to run this command. But after a very quick little setup process, you should see something that says Homebrew is installed. And after that, you should then successfully be able to run Witch Brew and see something like this appear. All right, so now that we've got Homebrew installed, we can move on down to the next step, which is to install the kubectl command line tool. Remember, this is the tool that we're going to use to interact with the Kubernetes master. So to install this, which is a command line tool, all we have to do is run brew install kubectl. Yep, that's it, just that easy. So at my terminal, I'll run brew install kubectl. Now for me, I'm getting a little warning right here because I already have it installed, but for you, you'll very quickly see a bunch of text scroll over the screen, and then something at the bottom should more or less say kubectl has been added. And to verify that it was, we can run which kubectl, and we should see a path like this appear on the screen. So hey, not that bad, right? Okay, for the next step, we're going to install a virtual machine driver called VirtualBox. This is a executable that we're going to download at virtualbox.org. So inside of a new browser tab, I'll navigate to virtualbox.org. On the left-hand side, I'll find the download section. And then I'll find OSX hosts right here. When you click on that link, it's going to automatically start downloading the installer. So go ahead and click on it. It's about 90 megabytes or larger, so, so you'll download it rather quickly. And then once you've downloaded it, pull that thing open inside of a folder explorer. And you should see the virtualbox.dmg file. So we can double click on this thing. That'll pop, pop open a window like this. We're gonna find the installer up here on the top left hand side. Double click it, and it's gonna start up a installation wizard. And so as usual, go ahead and hit continue, 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 and you're pretty much going to be good to go. Now I've already installed VirtualBox, so I'm going to close out of this thing myself. Once you have finished the installation of VirtualBox, which should take just a couple of seconds or so, we'll move on to the last item, or second to last item, which is to install Minikube. And remember, Minikube's job is to make sure that we can use that virtual machine to boot up a single node and configure it to run Kubernetes. So to install Minikube, back at our terminal, we'll run brew cask install Minikube. So back at my terminal, brew cask install Minikube. Now once again, I already have this program installed, so I'm probably gonna see a warning or error message here rather quickly, but you will install this thing and then you should eventually see something that says, okay, good to go with Minikube. And of course you can run the command which Minikube and see a path like this appear once you have successfully installed it. All right, so now the very last thing that we're going to do is run a command with Minikube. We're going to execute Minikube start. And when you run this command, it's going to automatically access the copy of VirtualBox that you just downloaded and installed. It's going to use that to set up a virtual machine, and then it will configure that virtual machine to behave as a Kubernetes node. So to start up Minikube, I'll flip back over to my command line, and I'll run Minikube start. Okay, we should see something that says starting VM up here on the screen. Now this is gonna take several minutes, so we're gonna pause the video right here and we'll continue in the next section. By the way, if it appears that this thing is not progressing, if it feels like it's just completely stuck, you can exit out of the start process with a control C and then start it back up again with another mini cube start. So I'll leave it right here. I'll let this command finish up and then I'll see you in the next section. In the last couple of sections, we went through the setup process on Kubernetes on Mac OS and Windows. To make sure that everything is working as we expect now, I'm going to open up my terminal and run Minikube status. When I do so, I should see Minikube running, cluster running, and kubectl correctly configured. 
I'm also going to run the command kubectl cluster dash info like so. And I should see a message like this right here appear. If you see any warning or any error message, it means that something went wrong during the setup process. And you will want to flip over to the QA section on this video and go through a little bit of troubleshooting steps to get everything fixed up. Okay, so now that everything is up and running, we're gonna set ourselves a little short-term goal. So we're gonna say that as a short-term goal, we want to take the multi-client image that we had put together over the last couple of sections and get it up and running on our Kubernetes cluster that is now locally created on your machine by Minikube running as a container. So that's the goal. Now to just say this as a goal without giving any kind of directions or path to get to, get to it is kind of hard. So I'm going to show you a sequence of diagrams that are going to give you a good idea of how to transfer some of your existing knowledge in the area of Docker Compose over to all this Kubernetes stuff. All right, so here we go. We've put together several Docker Compose files throughout this course. And when we were working on the multi-compose or excuse me, multi-container project, we ended up with a Docker file that had a couple of different services inside of it. And there's a couple of observations I want to make about the Docker compose files that we've created throughout this course. The first observation I want to make is that in these Docker compose files, every entry, or in other words, each of these different services that we created can optionally use Docker compose to build the image. And we did that with Nginx, with Worker, and the client. Remember, we specified the build section that provided the path to a context and a Docker file as well. The next observation I have is that each of the entries inside of here represents specifically a container, a container we wanted to create. We were only creating containers through Docker Compose. We did not create any other type of software or program or anything like that. It was specifically containers that were being created inside of our Docker Compose file. And that sound like, might sound like a weird thing to observe, but let's just hold on for that for right now. Now, the last observation I have is that every entry inside the Docker Compose file also optionally defined some networking requirements. In other words, it set up all that port mapping, right? It set up a outside port on a local machine to a port inside one of our containers, as was the case for say the Nginx image. Okay, so we got these three observations right here. Now I wanna take these observations and kind of map their equivalents into the Kubernetes world. And so this is going to allow you to translate some of your existing Docker Compose knowledge into the Kubernetes world. Okay, here we go. So first off, each entry that we put inside of that Docker Compose file optionally allowed us to build an image. So in the Kubernetes world, we don't get any benefit like that. With Kubernetes, we are expected to come with all of our images already built. So Kubernetes has no build pipeline. There is no build process. If you're gonna make use of Kubernetes, the expectation is that during some outside step, you're going to build all of your different images and have them ready to go, ready for deployment onto your Kubernetes cluster. Now, the next big observation was that each entry inside of our Docker Compose file represented a container that we wanted to create. With Kubernetes, things are just a little bit different. With Kubernetes, we do not have a single config file. Instead, we're going to end up with multiple configuration files. Each of these different configuration files that we're going to put together are going to attempt to create a different object. An object is not necessarily going to be a container. Now, you might be wondering, well, what would we ever create when we're talking about these container things than a container? Well, we'll take a look at what it means to create an object in just a second. But for right now, just understand that we use multiple configuration files to create different objects that are going to be in use inside of our Kubernetes application. And the final thing I want to mention, so we had said that each entry inside of the Docker Compose file defined the different networking requirements. So in the Kubernetes world, we have to manually set up a vast majority of all of our networking. So remember in Docker Compose, if we created all of these different containers inside of a single Docker Compose file, we could very easily connect to other containers. In addition, if we wanted to do any port mapping, it was as easy as adding in a little entry to the Docker Compose file. So in the Kubernetes world, the process of kind of joining together two containers with networking or exposing a port on a container to the outside world is a much more, far more involved process. And a vast majority of the work that we do throughout the rest of this course is going to be 
all focused 100% on some of these networking topics. That's going to be one of the biggest things that we discuss. Okay, so with all these kind of mappings over in mind, I now want to think about how we're going to essentially treat each of these items as we think about our current goal of getting the multi-client image working on Kubernetes. All right, so I put a final column into this diagram, and these are going to be the steps that you and I are going to go through to make sure that we are able to get our simple container up and running. So when we think about Kubernetes expecting all images to already be built, that means that you and I are going to have to make sure that our image, specifically the multi-client image, is already built and pushed up to Docker Hub. So we're just going to confirm that that is the case. And you'll recall that through the last application that we worked on, we spent a tremendous amount of time making sure that our images were being pushed up to Docker Hub. So our images should already be there. We're just going to make sure that that is the case. Next up, with Kubernetes, we make one config file per object we want to create. So that means that we're definitely going to make one config file to create our container. Now we're going to go into great detail on this right here because technically we're not going to be making our container per se. We're going to be making something else slightly different. But again, we'll go into that in great detail. Now finally with Kubernetes, we have to set up all that man networking manually. So you and I are going to make an additional configuration file to set up some networking between our container and essentially the outside world. Or in other words, remember, with our multi-client image, we were starting up an Nginx server and serving up some production React files. And so if we want to be able to access that container from within our web browser, we're going to have to do a little bit of networking setup with Kubernetes. So in total, we need to make sure our image is on Docker Hub. We need to make one config file to create our container or something that's going to essentially represent or contain the container. Again, we'll talk about that in great detail. And then we'll make a second config file to set up some networking and make sure that our container created during this step is accessible from our web browser. So quick pause, we're going to come back to the next section and we'll get started on step number one. So I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we spoke about the series of steps that we're going to go through to get our first container up and running on Kubernetes. So the first thing we're going to do is double check Docker Hub and just make sure that our image is up there for the multi-client image. All right, so to get started, I'm going to open up a new browser tab and I'll navigate to hub.docker.com. And once over here, I'll look at my list of repositories and just verify, yep, my image is up here, Steven Greider slash multi-client. This is the repository that contains the image that we want to create a new container out of on our local Kubernetes cluster. Okay, that was easy enough. So I'm going to close that tab. And we're now going to move on to our second task, which is to make a one config file to create our container. Now, to make this config file, we're going to create a new project directory. We're going to open up our code editor inside that project directory, and then we're going to start writing a little bit of configuration into it. All right, so I'm going to flip on over to my terminal. You'll notice that I'm back inside of a workspace directory of sorts, so I'm no longer inside of that complex folder that we had been working in previously. Out here, I'm going to make a new folder called simple k8s. The term k8s is a little abbreviation for the word Kubernetes, and you'll very frequently see the word k8s in place of Kubernetes in a lot, a lot of documentation. The 8 in there is meant to represent the 8 letters between k and s in the word Kubernetes. Okay, so I'm going to make that directory. I'll then change into it. Eventually, there we go. And then I'm going to start up my code editor inside that directory. All right, there we go. So now inside of here, we're going to make a configuration file. And remember, the ultimate goal of this file is to create our container inside of our local Kubernetes cluster. So inside my code editor, I'm going to make a new file called client-pod.yaml. And then inside of here, we're going to list out a little bit of configuration to create our container. Now, I'll be completely honest with you. I want to be like as transparent as I possibly can. These first dozen or half dozen videos on the topic of Kubernetes, this is the fifth time that I've gone through and recorded all this stuff. So I've recorded four times already and deleted everything because I just wasn't happy with it. So in this try or this run through of recording this stuff, we're going to do things just a little bit differently. We're going to write out all the configuration inside this file. 
and we're going to write out all the configuration inside that second configuration file as well. And then once you see all this configuration in front of you, we're then going to do a real big discussion and talk about exactly what every line of this configuration means. Now, like I said, I've kind of gone recorded this stuff like four times, and I'm convinced that writing stuff out is probably the best way to expose you to this. So the good news is, we're going to learn exactly what's going on inside these two configuration files. The bad news is that you and I are going to do a pretty good amount of typing right now. So as usual, I got to ask you, please triple check your spacing, triple check your spelling, make sure you got everything dead accurate the same as I. Otherwise, you're going to run into a, a little bit of issues down the road. Okay, so let's get to it. Inside of here, I'm going to first type out API version colon v1. I'll do kind pod. I'll do metadata, and then I'll do an indent and say name is client-pod. I'll say labels, and then I'll indent another line and do component colon web. Then I'm going to go all the way back out, so no more indentation. I'll say spec containers, and then I'll do a dash to indicate an entry inside of an array. I'll say name client image of your Docker ID, so Steven Greider for me, slash multi-client like so. Now remember, when we put in this image name right here, that is assuming that our image is up on Docker Hub. If your image, for whatever reason, for multi-client is not on Docker Hub, you can always make use of my image name, which is, or excuse me, my Docker ID, which is Steven Greider. I'll then list off my ports that I want to open up for connecting to from the outside world just as we did before over inside of our Docker Compose file. I'm gonna have a single entry here, and I'll say container port is 3000, like so. Okay, so that's our first configuration file. Now, again, I gotta ask you, please, just, I'm begging you, triple check your indentation, triple check your spelling on what you have. And once you're happy, we're going to create one other configuration file that's going to do a little bit of networking setup for us and make sure that the container that we're creating with the first configuration file will be exposed or available to the outside world. So inside my code editor, I'm going to make another file. I'm going to call this one client-node-port.yaml. Okay, and then inside of here, we're just going to do a little bit more typing, and then we'll talk about what all this stuff is doing in more detail than you could ever possibly imagine. It will be great. Okay, so inside the new file, we'll say API version is v1. I'll say kind is service. We'll do metadata. I'll give a name of client-node-port. Then I'm going to unindent, so I'm all the way back out to the left-hand side, and I'll say spec with a type of node port. We'll do a ports array. So I'll do an entry in the array indicated by this little dash right here. And I'll say port is 3050. I'll do a target port of 3000. And I'll say node port of 31515, like so. And then finally, I'm going to unindent. So I'm back online with type and ports. And then I'll say selector is component colon web. And I'll save the file. Now again, I got to ask you, please, please, please triple check your spelling inside of here. Triple check the indentation. Remember, inside of a YAML file, if your indentation is not perfect, the file will be misinterpreted and nothing is going to work the way you expect. Okay, so that's all the typing we got to do. Now we're going to take a quick pause right here. We're going to come back to the next section and we're going to go over both these files in just tremendous detail. So quick pause and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we put together a ton of configuration inside of two different files. In this section, we're going to start to pull these two files apart line by line. We're going to first focus on the first two lines in each file. So specifically API version v1 and kind pod. You'll notice that the other file has the very similar same two lines at the top. But in the second file, we have kind of service. So again, we're going to focus on these two lines to get started. And just so you know, we're going to first, between the two of them, we're going to first focus on exactly what kind is referring to. All right. So just as we discussed a couple moments ago, we had said that with Docker Compose, we had created a configuration file to describe the different containers that we want to create. 
And we had did so done something very similarly over with Elastic Beanstalk as well. Now with Kubernetes, we do make these config files to make containers, but we had kind of honed in on that definition with this diagram over here and said that when we make a config file with Kubernetes, we're not quite making a container, we're kind of making something else slightly different. We're making something called an object. And so I first want to focus on exactly what an object is and help you get an understanding of what an object is. All right, so back over here. Okay, so we've written two configuration files. We're going to eventually take these two configuration files we put together and feed them into the cube CTL command line tool that we installed a couple of videos ago. Remember, that is the cube CTL command that we had ran at our terminal just a moment ago. Just a second ago, we ran cluster info, like so. So eventually, we're going to take these two configuration files and pass them into this command line tool. When we pass them in, kubectl are going to, is going to interpret both those files and create two objects out of each file. So the config files that we write are going to be used to create objects in general. The term object is a reference to a thing that exists inside of our Kubernetes cluster. And so we don't specifically say that we are making objects quite so much. In reality, we are making specific types of objects. And in this diagram right here, I'm showing you a couple of sample object types. So an example of an object would be a stateful set. Another example of an object would be a replica controller. These are all things that we can create inside of our Kubernetes cluster that have very specific purposes to make our application work the way we expect. Two other examples of object types that we're going to very frequently be using is a pod and a service. And you might have noticed that inside of our two configuration files, we have the word pod next to kind, and we have the word service next to kind as well. So the first thing to understand here is that the kind entry inside of all the configuration files that you and I are going to write is meant to represent or indicate the type of object that we want to make. So in our clientpod.yaml file, we are making an object of type pod because that's what we entered in for the kind property. In the client node port file, we are making an object of type service because that's what we represented for the kind property over here as well. Now you might be curious, what exactly is an object? What are they used for? Well, like I just said, they're essentially things that are going to be created inside of our Kubernetes cluster to get our application to work the way we might expect. And so for example, every object that we're going to create or every type of object has a slightly different purpose. Some objects are used to run a container, as is the case with a pod. A pod is used to run a container. Other types of objects might monitor a container. Other types of objects, such as a service, are going to set up some kind of networking. And so we made an object of type service to set up some networking inside of our Kubernetes cluster. Okay, so that's kind of a brief overview on exactly what API, or excuse me, what kind service and kind pod mean. Now I want to tell you a little bit more about API version v1 on both these files. All right, let's see, over... Here, here we go. So when we specify the API version at the very top of the file, that essentially scopes or limits the types of objects that we can specify that we want to create with any given configuration file. So inside of both of our configuration files, we specified an API version of v1. That essentially opens up access to us to a predefined set of different object types. And so we have access or our configuration file in both cases, because we are designating API version v1, we can create an object of type component status or config map or endpoints or event or namespace or pod or any of another of other object types that I'm not reflecting inside this diagram. If we had used a different API version, such as API version colon app slash v1, we get access to a different set of object types. And so if we had put in app slash v1, we could have created an object of type controller revision or an object of type stateful set. Now in practice, the API version flag is just a little bit annoying. I'll be honest with you. What you're usually going to do with any configuration file you put together is you're first gonna decide on what kind of object or what type of object you want to create. You'll then figure out what API group that object type belongs to, and then you're just gonna go look up that API version and stick it into your configuration file. So in other words, 
I knew that we had wanted to create something to create a container inside of our Kubernetes application. And so based on my knowledge, I knew that we needed to create a pod. So what I did was I looked up a document that said, hey, if you want to make a pod, you have to be using the pool of object types designated in API version v1. And so that's why I put down API version v1 inside my config file. It's because ahead of time, I knew that I had wanted to make a pod. So the reason that I say that this API version is a little bit annoying is that it's mostly a reactionary feature. And you just got to go do a little bit of reference to figure out what you should be specifying. Now, throughout this course, I'm going to be telling you in great detail about exactly what API version we're going to be specifying for every config file we put together. So you don't really need to worry about memorizing these things that much throughout this course. OK, so at this point, we've discussed what API version means. We've also discussed what kind means, although we haven't really discussed what a pod is or really discussed what a service is. So let's take a quick pause right here. We're going to come back to the next section and expand, expand on exactly what a pod is. So I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we expanded upon the API version and kind properties inside of both our config files. We're now going to start to talk about what a pod is, and then we'll very quickly talk about what a service is as well. Okay, so a pod. All right, quick diagram. Let's find it here. Here we go. All right, so just a moment ago when we went through that setup process to install Minikube and kubectl on your local machine, remember we installed Minikube and then we ran that command Minikube start. When we ran that command, it created a new virtual machine on your computer. We refer to that virtual machine that is now running on your computer as a node. That node is going to be used by Kubernetes to run some number of different objects. Now, one of the most basic objects that you and I are going to create throughout this course is something that we refer to as a pod. And so when we start to load up this configuration file right here into kubectl, we're going to push into kubectl, and it's going to create a pod inside of that virtual machine that is running on your computer. And remember, we refer to that thing as a node. Now, the pod itself is essentially a grouping of containers with a very common purpose. Now, you might be wondering why we're making a pod that has a grouping of containers when just a moment ago I had told you, oh, yeah, we want to get something running as a container. Well, in the Kubernetes world, there is no such thing as just creating a container on a cluster. Back with Elastic Beanstalk, back with Docker Compose, we were creating containers willy-nilly all day, no issue whatsoever. But in the world of Kubernetes, we do not have the ability to just run one naked single container by itself with no associated overhead. The smallest thing that you and I can deploy is a pod. So we're always going to be declaring, or excuse me, we're always going to be deploy, deploying containers within a pod. That's the smallest thing that we can deploy to run a single container. Now you might be wondering, why is that? Why would we make a pod at all? Well, let's talk about why we would make a pod. So the requirement of a pod is that we must run one or more containers inside of it. Now, when I say one or more containers, you might very quickly think back to the multi-container application that we put together. As a, let's pull up a quick diagram of that thing. I've got one around here somewhere. Here we go. So back on the multi-container application we put together, we had our Elastic Beanstalk, and it was running multiple different containers all in this single little grouping. And so when I tell you that inside of a pod, we will run one or more containers, you might be thinking, oh, OK, that's it. Like, game over. We're going to take our four containers or four images right here and create four of these containers inside of this one single pod. Well, that would definitely be an option, but it's not what a pod is meant to do. The purpose of a pod is meant to group, to, it is, excuse me, the purpose of a pod is to allow the grouping of containers with a very similar purpose, or containers that absolutely positively must be deployed together and must be running together in order for our application to work correctly. Now, even when I say that, you might be thinking, well, Stephen, Back here on this application, we had to have the Express server deployed with Nginx up here to serve the React application or respond to API calls. So you might be thinking, yeah, you know, this thing had to have all these different containers put together to work correctly. Well, actually, that's not 100% accurate. You see, back on this application, if our worker container over here crashed for any reason, 
the rest of the application would still function A-OK. -okay. If the Nginx React server right here failed, well, everything would still pretty much work correctly. If the Express API closed down, well, everything else would at least kind of still function. In other words, if we take away the vast majority of these containers, the rest of the containers inside the group are still going to generally function the way we expect. It's definitely not ideal, but they would definitely continue to work. Now, in the world of a pod, when we start to group together containers, we are grouping together containers that have a very discrete, very tightly coupled relationship. In other words, these are containers that absolutely have a tight integration and must be executed with each other. So as an example, let's imagine a pod that is running three containers that you see right here. This would be a good example of when we would use a pod with multiple containers. So in this example, I've got a Postgres container. So that's running the Postgres database. And then in addition to that, we've got two other containers. Now, these are imaginary images that I've listed here. So there is no image called logger that I know of. There probably is, but yeah, I'm just making this thing up. And I don't really know of any image called backup manager. So again, these are two imaginary containers that we're just kind of pretending exist. You could pretend that the logger container might need to connect over to Postgres and store some database logs. And maybe this backup manager needs to connect to the Postgres container and do a SQL dump or something like that and make a backup of all the data inside that database. And so again, this would be a very good example of why we would want to use a pod with multiple containers. A logger like this right here is 100% intended to connect to this Postgres container and pull some information out of it. If the Postgres container goes away, the logger 100% worthless. No two ways about it, the logger is completely useless at that point in time. And it's the same thing with the backup manager as well. The backup manager might need to reach into this Postgres container and pull out some information to make a database backup. And so the backup manager 100% has a very tight integration, very close relationship with the Postgres container. And again, if that container goes away, the backup manager no two ways about it, 100% worthless. So again, in the world of Kubernetes, we make use of pods as the smallest thing that we can deploy. We cannot deploy individual containers by themselves as we could with Docker Compose or Elastic Beanstalk. Anytime we want to deploy a container in the world of Kubernetes, we have to make use of a pod. A pod can run one or more containers inside of it. Inside this course, you and I are only going to be running one container inside of any given pod. But reasons that you might want to add in more containers is if you have some other containers that have a very, very tight integration with other containers that exist inside the pod. So with all that in mind, if we flip back over to our clientpod.yaml file, Again, we're specifying a object type of pod inside of here, and hopefully now some of the other configurations inside of here might make a little bit more sense. We are creating a pod that's going to run one container inside of it. We're going to give that container an arbitrary name of client. The name of client right here is, for our purposes, largely going to be related to logging and giving us the ability to reference this running container. But if we were running other containers inside of here as well, we could also use this name property to get some networking or connections between these different containers that are running inside the single pod. The image property, well, I bet you can guess what that is. That's the name of the image or the repository off on Docker Hub that this container is going to be made out of. And then finally, the ports entry on here is, eh, you know, it's kind of like that port excuse me, that port mapping stuff that we were doing before, the ports of container port right here is essentially saying that on this container that we're going to create, we want to expose port 3000 to the outside world. Now you might be curious, why are we exposing port 3000 in particular to the outside world? Well, if you recall back to our multi-client project, here's the source code for multi-client right here. There's the client directory. We had created a Nginx server that runs inside of that container and it listens on port 3000. So we set up that container port 3000 right here because we're going to eventually want to expose port 3000 to the outside world. So this line, at least right here, is very similar to some of the stuff that we did back inside of our docker run.aws.json file with Elastic Beanstalk. And it's also similar to some of the stuff that we did inside of our Docker Compose file as well. This is setting up our port mapping. 
Now, one thing I want to be really, really clear about is that this is not the full story of port mapping inside the world of Kubernetes. This line of code right here alone is not going to give us access to port 3000 inside of our running container. In order to get that networking set up, that was the entire job of the second configuration file we put together. And so that's going to serve as a nice segue. Let's take a quick break right here. When we come back, we're going to start talking about the purpose of this service object that we put together inside the second file as well. So quick pause and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we went over the majority of our client pod.yaml file. We spoke about what a pod is and what its purpose is. We also spoke about the spec section down here a little bit, but we have not yet spoken very much about this metadata section. Now, very quickly on metadata, the name is pretty much what you would expect. It's gonna name the pod that gets created, and this is mostly used for a lot of logging purposes. We're gonna see the name of client pod used when we start using kubectl to print out information about our running cluster at the terminal. Now, the other piece of information inside of metadata is labels right here with component web, and that's very tightly coupled to the other config file that we're going to start to discuss right now. So in this section, we're gonna focus on the second config file we put together, the one with a kind of service. So let's talk about what's going on inside here. All right, so at this point, we've spoken about the object with type pod. A pod is used anytime we want to run one or more very closely related containers. So we're now gonna start talking about a second kind of very commonly used object. The second object type that we're gonna discuss, and again, this is a type that we're going to be discussing just so, so much throughout this course because all this networking stuff is so important to understand. Anyways, second object type, yeah, services. We use this object type anytime that we want to set up some amount of networking inside of a Kubernetes cluster. So let's take a look at a couple of diagrams that are going to give you a better idea of exactly what a service is and how it behaves. Now, the first thing I want you to understand is that in the world of pods, we have basically just pods, that's it. Like that is the object type. But in the, in the world of services, there are four very commonly used subtypes. In fact, there's only four subtypes. And so I've listed all the subtypes of the service object type right here. So as a service, we can create a service of type cluster IP, node port, load balancer, and ingress. Inside of our particular file, we specified a object type or a primary object type of service with the kind property up here. And then inside of the spec section, we specified a subtype or a type of service known as a node port. So we are making a node port service. The purpose of a node port service is to expose a container to the outside world, or in other words, to be able to allow you, like you as a developer on your computer, to open up your web browser and access that running container. A node port service is only good for development purposes, and we do not use node port as a service type inside of production environments outside of one or two very specific exceptions. And actually one of those exceptions is something we're going to cover later on inside this course. Now, you'll notice that on the other service types on here, I'm not putting any notes or anything on here. We are going to talk about the other service types in tremendous detail throughout this course. Again, services and networking is a very important topic to understand. But if I added in those other descriptions right now, it would just be a little bit confusing. So I'm going to leave the other descriptions off. And for right now, we're just going to focus on the node port service type. Okay, so again, node port is something that we use to expose a container to the outside world and essentially allow you and I to access that container inside of our browser. Now, I want to show you a series of diagrams to give you a better idea of what this service is doing for us. So inside this diagram, the overall blue box is our computer. And so at some point in time, you and I are going to want to open up our browser and connect to that multi-client container that is running inside of our pod. That pod and the container inside of it are running on the local Kubernetes node. Remember, this is the VM created by Minikube that is running on your local machine. Now, when we create that service of type node port, it's gonna set up a communication layer between the outside world and the container running inside of that pod. You'll notice that there's another box on here called the cube proxy. Every single node or every single member of a Kubernetes cluster that we create has a program on it called the cube proxy. The cube proxy is essentially the one single window to the outside world. 
So anytime that a request comes into a node, it's going to flow through this thing called the cube proxy. This proxy is going to inspect the request and decide how to route it to different services or different pods that we may have created inside of this node. So right now I'm only reflecting one service right here, but over time we might end up with multiple different services. Something like that right there, as messy as that may be. And so when we end up with multiple services inside of a single node, it would be up to Cube Proxy to make sure that incoming requests are sent off to the appropriate service. Now when a request comes into the node port service that you and I are going to create, it's going to attempt to take that request and forward it onto port 3000 on our multi-client container that we defined to run inside of our pod. Now that gives you an idea of the placement of the service here, but that doesn't really ex kind of describe everything else that's going on inside of here. So what's going on with the three different ports? And what's going on with the selector down here? Let's take a look at another diagram that's going to be slightly more detailed than this one right here that's going to give you a better idea of those different pieces of configuration and their purpose. Okay, so very similar diagram, just with more detail added in. Yeah, I just got to fix that thing or I'm going to go crazy. Okay, so on the service, you'll notice I added in kind of a long statement right here. If you look at the client configuration file, you'll notice that at the very bottom is a selector that says component colon web. You'll also notice that there's nothing else inside this file that seems to indicate that it should be hand that this service should be handling network traffic for our pod with the name of client pod. So here's the pod file. It's got a name of client pod. Here's the service file. Nowhere in here do we say client pod. So in other words, there's nothing inside of here that says, I need to send traffic to client pod. There's no declaration like that inside of here. Instead, rather than referring to the service or excuse me, the pod that we want to have this service direct traffic to, rather than using any naming system, we instead use a system in Kubernetes called the label selector system. So inside of this service file, you'll notice that down at the bottom, we have a selector of component colon web. And then over here, back inside of the pod file, we have a metadata labels property of component colon web. That's how these two different objects get linked together. When the service first boots up, it's going to say, okay, I need to do some port forwarding. I don't know who I'm supposed to forward this traffic to. It's then going to see its selector property down here, and it's going to say, oh, okay, I'm going to look for any other pod or any other object that is running that has a key value pair of component colon web. And if I see any other object running inside these, this Kubernetes cluster with the label of component colon web, I'm going to direct all traffic to these ports on that thing. So the service that we've created and the pod that we created are linked together by the label inside the client pod and the selector inside the service. Now, the one thing that I want to make sure is really clear is that the selector that we've used here of component colon web is 100% arbitrary. So we could have just as easily called this thing like tier front end. If we had made that change, we would just need to make sure that the client pod has the same label as well. And so back inside the client pod, we would need to have tier front end as well to make sure that the two are 100% identical and match up perfectly. Now I am going to undo those changes and I'm going to go back over to component colon web on both configuration files. Okay, so again, when the service boots up, it says I'm going to look at my selector property and it's going to see that it has a key value pair of component colon web. It's then going to reach out in the Kubernetes cluster and it's going to find every other object that has a label of component colon web. And it's going to attempt to expose port 3000 to the outside world, more or less. And so of course our pod needs to have the appropriate label of component colon web. Okay, so that brings us up to speed on the selector inside the client node port file and the label in the client pod file. Now the last thing I want to tell you about is the collection of ports right here. We have ports, target port, node port, all these different things. Now, one quick thing I just realized, I put ports right here. That is a little typo. It should be port singular, like so, my mistake. I'll mention that again at the end of this video, just to make sure that if you're speeding through this section, you don't miss out on that little fact. Okay, so in the service, we have a port section 
This is describing all the different collections of ports that need to be opened up or mapped on the target object. One thing I want to point out here is that the service ports property is an array, and so we could very easily have additional ports that we're trying to be mapped on here as well. So we could do like, I don't know, 9,000 or whatever it might be. Now, something that might seem a little bit weird is the fact that we have three different ports inside of here. First thing I want you to notice is that the target port of 3000 is identical to the container port over inside of the pod definition. Now, that's not really a lot of help. Let's just look at a diagram. <laughs> it's going to explain these different things. All right, I'm wasting time. Here we go. Okay, so inside the node port service, we're exposing those three different properties, or we have defined those three different properties. Now, the first thing that we're defining inside there is port. Port for you and me is more or less 100% worthless for the application that we are putting together right now. The port property is going to be the port that another pod or another container inside of our application could access in order to get access to the multi-client pod. So this multi-client pod right here, that represents the actual pod that the service is trying to map traffic over to. So we can imagine if that if there is some other pod inside of our application, like let's say other pod right here, if there's some other pod that needs access to multi-client, it could connect to it through this port designation right here. And so again, for you and I, for the application we're doing to right now, this port property is not useful because we do not have any other objects or anything else inside of our Kubernetes cluster that's going to attempt to reach into that multi-client pod. Now the next property inside there is the target port. So as you might imagine, the target port is the port inside of that pod that we want to open up traffic to. We used a target port of 3000 right here, which indicates that we want to send any incoming traffic into port 3000 inside of this pod. And port 3000 has been mapped up to the multi-client container. Now the last thing on here is the node port. You'll notice that for the node port, we used a rather large port number. I used 31515. Now the node port is the one that you and I probably care about the most whenever we make use of a node port type. The node port is the port that you and I inside of our browser are going to access whenever you and I like want to actually test out the container running inside that pod. So the node port right here is going to be essentially what you and I type into our browser. So as the URL, you know, we'll do whatever the IP address is, colon three, what was it? 31515. So we're going to type in that port into our browser in order to access the multi-client pod. So again, we can kind of ignore the port property for this application we're doing right now. The node port is what gets exposed to the outside world, and the target port is what gets opened up inside of the targeted pod. Now, the last thing I want to mention is that the node port is going to always be a number between 30,000 and 32767. If you do not specify the node port, so we are not required to specify it, we could actually delete it if we wanted to. If we do not specify that port, one will be randomly assigned to us and it'll be between 30,000 and 32767 as well. Now the reason, or I should say one of the reasons that you and I do not make use of the node port service in a production environment is because of these funky port mappings. Obviously, when a user goes to something like google.com, they want to go to google.com. They don't want to go to google.com colon 351515 or whatever, right? Now, again, that's just one reason of many that we do not use a node port in a production environment outside of some very specific exceptions. Okay, so I think that explains just about everything inside of our client pod file and the client node port file as well. So now the last thing we have to do is take these two configuration files and we're going to load them into our Kubernetes cluster through the kubectl command line tool. So quick pause and we'll come back in the next section. In the last section, we finished going through both of our configuration files and we're now ready to load these into our Kubernetes cluster and try to access our running container. So in order to do so, we're going to feed both these configuration files into our cluster through the kubectl command line tool. The command in particular that we're going to run is the apply command. So at the command line, we're going to run kubectl apply dash f and then the name of a configuration file, or I should say the path to the configuration file. Now kubectl, again, that's a command line tool that we use to mess around with everything going on inside of our Kubernetes cluster. 
The apply keyword means that we want to change the configuration of our cluster. And that's actually kind of a very loaded term. Like these words right here, change the current configuration. That's a real loaded term right there. And it's something that we're going to expand upon at great length in just a little bit. We then specify that we want to load in a file that contains all this configuration that we care about. So we're going to add on the dash F flag. And then the path to the file is the path to the file. That's pretty much it. So let's try flipping over to our command line and we're going to run this command two times. One time for the clientpod.yaml file and one time for the client nodeport.yaml file. So back in my terminal, I'm going to first make sure that I'm inside of my simple k8s directory, which is where I have those two configuration files. I'll then run kubectl, apply dash f, and let's first load up the client pod. So I'll say client dash pod.yaml. I'll hit enter, and then we'll very quickly see that the pod has been configured. Now, what does configured mean? Who knows? That seems a little bit mysterious. So it doesn't really seem to say that the pod was like, or the container was successfully created. And in fact, this message printed up a little bit too quickly for me to really feel like the container was successfully created. So we might need to do a little bit of a status check here in just a second to make sure that the pod was in fact started up successfully. But before we do, let's apply our other configuration file. So I'll do kubectl apply dash F. And then the other file was called client node port. So client node port.yaml. And again, I see configured message right here. Now again, in both cases, it seems like these messages appeared pretty quickly. So I don't really know if everything worked the way we ex would expect. So let's try figuring out how we can print out the status of both these different objects that we just created and just make sure that they were in fact successfully created. So in order to get the status of a different of any different object that you and I create through a configuration file or any other means, we're going to be making use of the kubectl git command. The git command is going to print out the status of an entire group of object types. So for example, we would say kubectl git pods. In this case, pods is the type of object that we want to get information about. KubeCTL will look at our Kubernetes cluster. It'll find all the different pods that have been created and it'll print out the status of every single one. So it's a very easy way to get a kind of high level look at everything that's going on inside of your cluster. So I'll do kubectl get pods at my terminal. And I'll see that I have one pod created. It has a name of client pod. One of one right here means that there is one copy of it running and we need to have one copy running. So the first number right here is the number of pods that are running. And the second number is the number of copies that we want to have. As we start to scale our application, we might want to have multiple copies of the exact same pod running. And so when that happens, you would expect to see one right here change to two, three, four, five, whatever it might be. We then see that the status is running. So it definitely looks like everything started up a okay. There have not been any restarts. So if your pod right here crashes for any given reason, it will be automatically restarted and you would see restarts right there increment by one. And then age of one hour means it's been running for one hour. Now, in my case, the thing has not actually been running for one hour. I just started up this pod a while ago and I forgot to close it before running the apply command, but not a big deal. You're going to see a age of like, you know, one minute or something like that. Okay, so now we're going to get the status of all the different services that we have created as well. So to get a printout of all of our different services, we're just going to slightly change the kubectl get command. We're going to say that we want to get a printout of all the objects with type service that we have created. So I'll say kubectl get services. And that's going to print out two different services. Now, chances are you have two services running as well. One might be Kubernetes with a type of cluster IP. If you see that, that's one of the inner workings of Kubernetes and you can completely ignore that thing. Now, hopefully you're gonna see a second service printed out in here with the name of client node port. Its type will be of course, node port. It'll have a cluster IP, an external IP, and then a listing of ports and age over here as well. Now, I want you to look very closely at port over here. You'll notice that there's both the port property and the node port property as well. And so as a quick reminder, the first number on there 
Where's our diagram? Here we go. So the first number on there is the port. That is the port that other pods or other objects would use to access the service that this thing part, or excuse me, the pod that this service points to. The second number is the node port. And so that is the port that you and I would use to access that service inside of our browser. You will notice that the one port that is not reflected inside of here is the target port. So the service does not report the port that is trying to open up inside the target pod. That's not done for any security issues. It's just done because like, who cares? <laughs> who cares, right? For that print up, you probably don't care about the target port. You probably only care about the port property and the node port. All right, so that's pretty much it. We have now deployed both of these objects and they are now running on our local cluster. So now the very last thing we have to do is attempt to access our running multi-client project inside of our browser. Now you might expect, and based on my wording right now, he'll, as you might guess, this is not the way we do it, you might expect that we would go to localhost colon, and then whatever we put in as the node port over here, 331515. Remember, this is the port that we use to access or test out our container inside the browser. So you might think that we go to localhost colon 35151 or whatever. I keep mistyping that thing. I'm just going to do a copy paste. There we go. So of course, when you go there, yeah, nothing works. So what's going on? Well, remember what is going on behind the scenes on your computer right now. Let's pull up a good diagram for this. This one right here, this'll do. Uh, let's do this one. Okay, so when we are inside of our browser, when we want to access some container that is running on that Kubernetes node VM created by Minikube, this is not addressed by localhost. In other words, all the ports that exist inside this node VM right here are not available on local host. In order to access this VM, we need to actually ask Minikube for the IP address that was assigned to this virtual machine when it was created on your computer. So this virtual machine right here that was created on your machine has its own IP address. And you need to visit that IP address in order to access any of the different services, any different pods that are running inside of here. So to access that IP address, we'll flip back over to our command line and we're going to run minikube IP. And that's gonna print out the IP address of that virtual machine. So at any point in time, forever inside this course and your own applications, anytime that you want to access some application that is running inside of Minikube or inside of that virtual machine, you are not going to use localhost. Just forget it. There is no localhost, period. No localhost. Anytime that you want to access a service or a container or a pod or whatever it might be that is running on your virtual machine or inside of your Kubernetes cluster, when you're running in development mode, you're going to run Minikube IP and you're going to use this IP address right here. So hopefully I made that memorable enough. <laughs> you're not going to use localhost. That's pretty much it. So we're going to copy this right here. I'm going to go back over to my browser. I'm going to put in that IP and then we're going to specifically access the port, the node port that we set up on that thing. So I'll say colon 31515. And I'm going to put that over inside my command line just to make sure it's really clear. Yeah, there's a colon on there. And remember, your IP address might be very different than mine. So do not go to my IP address. Go to whatever IP you see printed out at your terminal. All right, so we're going to go there. And lo and behold, we see our application appear on the page. Now, of course, if you open up your terminal, you're going to see a couple error messages because this thing is not able to access the Express API. That's totally fine. It's just because we have not actually set up that API inside of our Kubernetes cluster yet. Okay, so that's pretty much it. We have gone through the entire process of creating two different objects, both a pod and a service. We understand the differences between the two, and we understand that we have to create a service if we want to access anything inside of our running pod. Remember, by default, Kubernetes is far more restricted with all of its networking stuff than anything we ever did with Docker Compose or with Elastic Beanstalk. With Kubernetes, we have to be very, very explicit about all the networking that we want to set up. And we do all the networking setup by the creation of these different service things. So that's pretty much it. That's the basics of Kubernetes. So let's take a quick pause right here, and we're gonna start looking at some more complex stuff in the next section. In the last section, we went through a very long-winded demonstration of exactly what was happening inside of our local node. 
Now at this point in time, our understanding of the Kubernetes architecture is kind of limited to this diagram right here and a couple of discussions about, yeah, some networking stuff and nodes and blah, 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 very simple, straightforward stuff. So in this section, I want to change that in a big way. We're going to walk through the process of exactly what happened when we fed that configuration file into kubectl and get a better understanding of what is kind of happening behind the scenes. Now, before I do, I want to give you a very quick demonstration at my command line, and I want to show you something rather interesting, okay? So I'm going to flip over to my command line. Now, some of these commands you are not going to be able to issue successfully. If you run the commands I'm about to run, you will see an error message. So please don't try to run these. Just follow along visually for a second. I will show you how you can run these commands in just a moment as well. But for right now, just watch. Okay, so I'm going to first start off by doing a kubectl get pods. That's going to list out the current status of our running pod right here. And as you can see, it currently has restarts of zero and an age of one hour. Now I want to do something very interesting. I'm going to execute a command. You're going to see a Docker PS right here, and you're going to see that I'm running a tremendous number of containers right now. One of the containers I am running is the multi-client image. So this is the container that is running inside that pod right now. Now I'm going to take that container ID. Again, this is a container that's running inside that pod. I'm going to take the ID and I'll do a Docker kill with that ID. So this is going to completely kill that running container inside of that pod. So that's it. It is done. It's gone. Now I'm going to do a Docker PS again. And if I scroll all the way back up, you're going to very quickly see that it looks like, hey, wait a minute, it's still there. There's Steven Greider multi-client. That is the container running inside that pod. But you'll notice that the thing was only created two seconds ago. If I also run the command cube ctl get pods, you'll notice that there is now one restart reflected inside of here as well. And so the thing that I wanted to demo to you here very quickly that's going to kind of play into the diagram that we're going to look at in just a second is that it appears that if we manually delete or if one of those containers inside that pod crashes, it appears that it automatically gets restarted for us for free. So with that in mind, we're now going to look at a rather complex diagram. We're going to walk through the process of what happened when we deployed or applied, I should say, these two configuration files. Now, just a quick disclaimer, this is going to be a rather long video as we go through this discussion. So I don't know, pause it at some point, take a break if you feel like it. I don't know. Okay, so this diagram, super boring, not enough detail. I want to look at this right here. All right, so this is a little bit more realistic diagram. We're going to walk through this thing step by step and see what happens when we deploy one of those files. Now on the right hand side, you'll notice that I'm reflecting three separate nodes. Remember a node in the world of Kubernetes is a computer or essentially a physical computer or a virtual machine that is going to run some number of objects that we create inside of our cluster. You'll notice down here at the bottom center, I have something labeled called the master. On the right left hand side over here, we've got a deployment file. So the deployment file is essentially identical to the two files that we just put together that create a pod or a service. And then finally, up here on the top left hand side, I have the Docker Hub that lists a couple of the different images that we have created throughout this course. So let's walk through a series of actions now. We're going to start off with our deployment file down here. Now we're going to imagine that rather than creating a single instance, of the multi-client image or multi-client container, maybe we have a deployment file that instead says that it wants to create four copies using the multi-worker image. So we're just going to imagine for the sake of discussion that we slightly change our deployment file. We're then going to imagine that we take this file and we feed it into the kubectl apply command. Remember that is the command that we use to load up the two files that we had previously put together the client pod and client node port. So when we run this command right here, the file is taken and it is passed off to something called the master. Now on the master, there is a variety of different programs, three or four in total, that control your entire Kubernetes cluster. So there are four programs in total, but you and I are just going to kind of imagine for right now that there's just one program called the Kube API server. Again, four programs, we're just gonna kind of consolidate, consolidate it all down to one. The kube API server program 
is 100% responsible for monitoring the current status of all the different nodes inside of your cluster and making sure that they are essentially doing the correct thing. So we're going to imagine we take this deployment file and pass it into the master. Cube API server is going to see this new file. It's going to read the configuration file and it's going to interpret it in some fashion. The master then has a little kind of notepad of sorts that records all of its responsibilities, or essentially all the things that you and I have told it to do in the form of these deployment files. So when we feed in the deployment file, Cube API server is going to look at that file and it's going to see, oh, all right, the developer wants us to run four copies of multi-worker. And so Cube API server is going to update its little list of responsibilities and say, OK, I need to be running an image called multi-worker. I need to be running four copies of it. And right now, I am running zero copies. So Cube API server is going to update its little list of responsibilities right here. And it's going to say, oh boy, I need to be running four copies. And I'm currently running zero. Well, that's definitely bad news. So what's going to happen? Cube API server is then going to reach out to the three different nodes that are running. And it's going to say to each of these, hey, people, look, we got a big problem. We need to be running four copies of multi-worker, but right now we are running zero. So you three nodes, I want you to start up some number of copies of multi-worker. It's going to say to the first node down here, I want you to start up two copies of multi-worker. I want you to start up one copy. And I want you to start up one copy as well. Now, inside of each of these nodes, there is a copy of Docker running. That's right, a copy of Docker running inside of each of these virtual machines. That is true of the virtual machine that is running on your computer right now with Minikube as well. So technically, on your computer, you now have two copies of Docker running, both the copy created by Docker for Windows or Docker for Mac, and the copy that is running inside of that single node that has been created by Minikube. Now, when the master down here says you need to create two copies of multi-worker, one copy, one copy, the copy of Docker inside of each of these different nodes is going to spring to action. It's going to reach out to Docker Hub, and it's going to find the multi-worker image right here. It's going to copy or download that image and store it on some local image cache inside each of these nodes. Now, the thing to remember here is that each of these copies of Docker are 100% kind of autonomous, not connected. So they're all going to reach out and grab that, oops, not multi-client, but multi-worker image. And so you can kind of imagine that we get the multi-worker image inside of each of these nodes like so. Then each node is going to use that image to create a new container out of it. So we're going to create one copy of multi-worker as a container. We're going to make another copy down here. And then we had said that this last node would make two copies of the container, like so. Now remember, technically, each of these containers are being ran inside of that pod interface, or that pod object thing. But for the sake of this diagram, we're just going to say, yeah, the containers basically exist. But they are inside of pods nonetheless. So now that each of these have started up a copy of multi-worker, the master is going to reach back out to each one of these nodes and it's going to say, OK, need a status update. How are things going? It's going to look at the first node. It's going to see, OK, one copy. It's going to look at the second node. OK, one copy. It's going to look at the third node. Great, two copies. So in total, it now has four copies of multi-worker running. And so it goes back to its little list of responsibilities of sorts over here. And it's going to say, I now have four copies of multi-worker running. And at that point, the master says, all right, that's pretty much it. I'm going to sit back and relax because I've done my job. So that's pretty much the entire flow. Now, the last thing I want to mention is what happened when I did that Docker PS command over here. And then you'll recall I killed that running container with Docker kill on this ID right here. So what exactly happened there? Well, just a second ago when I said, oh, yeah, the master sit back, sits back and relax, well, that's not what really happens. You see, the master is always continuously pulling each of these different nodes. It's watching every single one, and any time that something happens inside one of these nodes, the master gets a little notification. So we can kind of imagine that when I ran docker kill, and then I killed that container, we can imagine that one of these containers essentially fell away, like so. So the master then got a little notification that said, hey, little issue here, one of our containers just up and died, completely gone. 
And so the master very temporarily updated its little list of responsibilities to say, okay, I need four copies of multi-worker, but I now have three copies running. Whoa, that's a big problem. So the master then looks back out at its collection of nodes and it says, maybe it picks this node right here and says, hey, you, you need to have an additional copy of multi-worker running. And so this node right here will use that image that it's already downloaded and it'll create a new container out of it. So multi-worker container. And then it reports back to the master and says, hey, we're good, I just started up another copy. And so the master says, great, I now have four copies running again and I am plenty happy. All right, so that is the full flow. That is what is happening behind the scenes. Now, some of the big takeaways that I want you to understand here from all this stuff. First off, when you and I loaded up that deployment file, we did not pass that deployment file directly off to one of these worker nodes. Instead, the deployment file went to the master. So the big lesson here is that you and I, as developers, work with this master. You and I do not work directly with the nodes over here. In other words, you and I are never going to reach into a node with some series of commands and attempt to manually start up a container inside of one of them. Instead, we're always going to use the kubectl command line tool, which is going to send all of our commands off to the master. It's then up to the master and the different programs that are running inside this thing to reach out to some appropriate node and create a, the appropriate container, or essentially update the state of, or I mean, update the appropriate container, update the appropriate node. It's up to the master to reach out to some node and tell it to do some amount of work to fulfill the master's little list of responsibilities. The next big thing to take notice of is that the master is always watching each of these different nodes. Anytime that some container or some object for that matter runs into some issue, the master is going to automatically attempt to recreate that object inside of some given node until its list of responsibilities is 100% balanced out. Now that kind of idea of us kind of saying, hey, master, here's your list of responsibilities, and then having the master constantly work to make sure that that list of responsibilities is fulfilled is one of the most important ideas in everything around Kubernetes. Yes, just as, as important as that other thing I said was really important, the networking stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of important stuff. You get the idea. But in reality, or all joking aside, the idea of the master constantly working to fulfill this list of responsibilities right here is very important. So we're going to take a quick pause right here, and we're going to have a real quick discussion. I'll, I'll make it as quick as I possibly can, I promise, about how we interact with Kubernetes in general and how we approach this idea of having the master kind of have this list of responsibilities that it needs to fulfill. So quick pause right now. We'll come back to the next section, and we're going to expand on this idea around the master. In the last section, we had a very long discussion about what Kubernetes is doing behind the scenes to deploy our application with some given deployment file. And there's a couple of takeaways I want to highlight very quickly. So here's a couple of important notes that I just want to kind of double down on and make sure are really clear. So first off, Kubernetes overall is a system to deploy containerized apps. We've been talking about services and pods and objects and all this stuff, but at its core, it's all about deploying containerized applications. Some of these different objects that we're going to make use of have a goal of supporting these containerized applications, but at the end of the day, it's all about running containers. Next up, a node is an individual machine, like a physical computer or a virtual machine that is going to run some number of containers or objects. On your computer with Minikube, you are currently running exactly one VM that is behaving as the node. We also have a master. This is a machine or virtual machine that has that set of programs that are going to be managing everything that goes on inside the nodes associated with your Kubernetes cluster. Now, the next item on here is uh, something we didn't quite cover. Remember Kubernetes, or I, no, excuse me, we did. We spoke about Docker Hub. So Kubernetes specifically did not build our image. It got the image that we wanted to deploy from Docker Hub. Next big thing is that the master decided where to run each container. You and I did not add in any input saying, hey, specifically, I want you to run this multi-worker container like over here or over here. Now, we absolutely can control where a container gets deployed. We can add in some configuration to our deployment files to say, oh yeah, I want this pod that gets created to be cr created on like this node or this node. We have the ability to do that, but by default, the master is going to decide where to deploy all of our different objects for us. 
Now the last two items on here, and this is the real focus of what I want to cover inside this section, is this is, is the important stuff. So to deploy something, we updated the desired state of the master with a config file, right? We passed in this deployment file over here and the master updated its little list of responsibilities to say, oh, okay, yeah, I understand. I'm supposed to be running four copies of the multi-worker image. So the way in which we interacted with our entire Kubernetes cluster was to update its desired state. We said, this is what we want you to be doing. We did not specifically say something like, hey, please create this copy of multi-worker and this copy and this copy and this copy. Instead, we just very generically say things like, I want to run four copies. And then we hand that directive off to the master. And the master is in charge of making that happen. Now, the other big important thing here is to understand that the master is going to work constantly to meet your desired state. And that was the entire purpose of me killing one of those containers and showing you that Kubernetes automatically restarted it for us. So the master is going to just constantly turn away at its list of responsibilities and make sure that our desired state right here, like the fact that we need to have four copies, is always going to be met. Now, again, this entire topic or this entire idea of having the master kind of work to meet our desired state and the entire idea of us passing some desired state to the master in the form of a configuration file is really key to understanding Kubernetes and how you and I work with it as a developer. So we're going to look at a couple more diagrams that are going to expand upon this idea of us kind of telling Kubernetes what we want, as opposed to us very specifically saying like, hey, please create this pod or something like that. And this overall topic is kind of a discussion between two ways of approaching deployment. We can approach deployment with a imperative style or a declarative style. With an imperative style, you and I would issue a series of commands that say specifically like, create this container and create this container, and then delete that one, and then upgrade that one, and restart that one, or whatever might need to happen. In the case of a declarative deployment, we say to our master something like, you know, it'd be great if you just made four containers happen, and made four containers happen all the time. And you know what, master, you just go ahead, you figure out how to deal with that. So with the imperative, we give very discrete actions, or excuse me, very discrete commands, with a declarative, we kind of set guidance or a directive. We say, just make this happen for me, would you please? Now, just kind of giving you a quick overview right there is not really enough. So I just want to show you a couple diagrams to really drill home the point or the differences between a imperative deployment and a declarative. Okay, so here's an example of a imperative deployment. I want you to imagine for a second that we did not have access to any of these configuration files or anything like that. And I want you to imagine that we just had access to the Kubernetes, some like imaginary Kubernetes command line. All right. So I want you to imagine that you and I have or need to have three containers. Like for whatever reason, we decide that our application has to have three containers right now. And let's imagine that we don't really have any Kubernetes commands or anything like that to get the current status of how many containers we are running. So what would you have to do to make sure that you have three containers? Well, chances are you would have to open up some dashboard on Google Cloud or AWS, and you would have to look at the overall state of your application. So maybe when you open up your dashboard, you see that you have four containers running. So what would you have to do to get three containers? You would have to very distinct, distinctly look at your current state and then figure out some way to migrate from your current state of four containers down to one container. And so you would have to just say, I'll there we go, fix that up really quickly. You would have to issue some command to say, okay, I need to remove one container to get from having four down to three. And so you might issue this imaginary command that says something like, you know, Kubernetes remove one container. Now, the important thing that I want to really drill home here, this is the really important thing to understand, is that even though it kind of seems trivial to say, okay, I need three containers and I currently have four, all I need to do is remove one, that still required a lot of computation out of you. You had to understand your desired state. So your desired state was to have three containers. You had to do some research to determine your current state, like how many containers you currently have. And then you had to come up with some migration path some series of actions that would take you from your desire or excuse me, from your current state to your desired state. 
And so you would have to come up with this migration plan that says, okay, I'm going to remove one container and that will take me from my current state to my desired state of three containers. Now, I'm sure that sounds like a trivial example, like, Stephen, really? Figuring out to remove one container is hard? Well, let's look at a more complex example, all right? Slightly more complex. So in this example of an imperative deployment, let's imagine for a second that you have a ton of different containers running, and they're all running some very specific version of the multi-worker image, like maybe version one. And so you come along and you decide, all right, I need to update every running container to use image version 1.23 instead. Now, in this case, things would be a lot more challenging. You would have to open up your dashboard. You would have to find all of the different containers that were running the multi-worker image. So for example, maybe like, you know, this container and this container and this container right here, maybe these were running a completely different image and you want to update this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. So maybe you would want to update the versions used by the green one. So now determining a migration strategy is a little bit more complicated. You have a desired state of running version 1.23 inside of every container. You have a current state where these container, 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 container are running maybe version one or whatever it might be. And so you would have to figure out some way of isolating just these green containers and saying, okay, I want to pick out like container one, two, three, uh, seven, 20 right here. And I want to update just those. And so you would have to figure out some series of update actions to just update that very specific set of containers. And again, I'm gonna argue that that might be really challenging for you to do. So how would we approach a problem like this with a declarative deployment rather than an imperative deployment? Another diagram. So this is how we would do things with a declarative deployment. You would say, okay, I need to update all of my containers running multi-worker to version 1.23. So here's what you would do with Kubernetes in an ideal world. You would open up your config file. So like this config file right here, the same one that we just put together a little bit ago. You would find the image designation right here. And you would update the tag on this thing to say, I specifically want to use version 1.23. You would then save that file. And then you would say, send that config file off to Kubernetes. Master would then inspect that file. It would update its own little list of responsibilities right here and say, oh, okay, I understand. I need to be running version 1.2, 1.2.3 or whatever it might be. And then the master is going to automatically find all the nodes that are not running version 1.23. It's going to take those all down. Excuse me, not nodes, but pods. It's going to take all the pods that are not running version 1.23 down. And it's going to create new pods that are running the correct version. And now my question to you is, which of these two deployment processes would you want to go through? Where's my diagram? Uh, over here. I, I bet you would probably want to use this declarative process. I bet anything you would not want to be responsible for looking at the current state of your cluster, finding all the outdated containers, and writing a command to update each of them. Instead, it would be far easier to just update a single config file, send that config file to Kubernetes and say, here you go, take care of it. Like, I don't care. It's up to you, figure it out. And Kubernetes, the master is going to constantly work to make sure that its configuration is met and make sure that whatever the real state of the nodes are is what it needs to be. Okay, so this has been a pretty long discussion and I think that you probably get the idea now of the differences between a imperative deployment and a declarative deployment. So why am I telling you all this? right? You know, this has been like 10 minutes. I'm really drilling in here. This has been a very in-depth talk. So the reason I'm telling you all this is that when you start looking at Kubernetes documentation, blog posts, Stack Overflow posts, whatever else, you are going to see some resources out there recommend that you take a imperative approach. You're going to see some resources that say, oh yeah, write in a command into kubectl that specifically adds a pod or specifically removes a pod or specifically updates a pod, whatever it might be. But I'm going to tell you that Kubernetes has the ability to go do things both ways. So Kubernetes has the set of commands through kubectl to take this imperative approach. That is the set of commands that some blog posts out there are going to advocate. And they're going to say, oh yeah, run something like pod update, whatever it might be. But Kubernetes or kubectl 
also has a set of commands to do things through a declarative approach as well. Throughout this course, you and I are going to constantly strive to only use the set of commands that take a de declarative approach to building out a Kubernetes cluster. That's the whole point. That's what I'm trying to convey here in this entire lecture. I want you to understand that when you start reading these blog posts, some of them are going to tell you to do things in an imperative way, but for any real production deployment, everything, every engineer out there, everyone in the community is always going to advocate taking the declarative approach. That's the entire point of Kubernetes. And so it's going to be kind of up to you when you're reading a blog post to understand that, okay, maybe not all these blog posts are saying things that are 100% accurate. And hopefully, eventually, you'll start to develop a sense of when a blog post says like, oh yeah, just go run this command to update this pod in place. That's probably something you don't want to do. In general, you and I are going to always going to, excuse me, you and I are going to always try to do the same thing over and over and over again of updating a configuration file and then sending that config file off to Kubernetes master again and again and again. And so throughout this entire course, everything that you and I are going to do from here to the very end is going to be all about updating these configuration files with some new desired state, and then eventually sending that off to Kubernetes master. And we're just going to repeat that process over and over and over. And that's exactly how you are going to do things on your own application. And that's how you're going to do things, especially in a production environment as well. All right, so that's enough soapboxing for me for a while. So let's take a quick pause right now. Now that we've gotten all that all the, out of the way, we'll take a quick pause right now, and we're going to continue in the next section. So quick break, and I'll see you in just a minute.